We came up with the name agnostic, meaning in doubt of the absolute truth, and front meaning about group and organization. Back then we headed the BYO and stuff like that, which is the better youth organization. We wanted to keep everybody together. And that was our whole purpose, and it still is today. When we first got into hardcore, even before we thought of making a band, uh, it was just an outlet. It was a place to go every weekend where you could go, and you could go nuts. You know, you get on that dance floor, and no matter what happened to you during that week, you got it out. Uh, if I wasn't at the hardcore right now, I don't know, I'd probably be like a truck driver or something. No more questions! Here's your answer from New York City! Sick of it all! Yo, New York! You remember what time it is? I grew up around Guidos and kids like that and cuisines and Shit, I was the only and white heavy metal kid kids. in my neighborhood. <laughs> and I was totally always getting beat up and always thrown around and, and I was rejected from that whole little society there. They couldn't accept me for what I was. So we and built I, our I, own. I found I found this clique of people that I, I got along with. We were people that, you know, that that strived for different things. And the kids that I was growing up with that were abusing me and beating me up now work at like offices or in supermarkets and Or they're all they fucking, or they're all Murphy's Law fans. <laughs> Back 1982, 83, it was like I said before, like a family. It was a life. It was like everybody's together. We were pretty much very. It was a very poor way of living. We all lived in one apartment, 188 Norfolk Street, down here in Low East Side. It was about 10 of us, and we our ways of eating or anything like that was we used to actually, you know, man on the street, you know, ask for change and stuff like that. We worked together. We'd all bring back money and we'd eat. It was a very poor lifestyle, and we lived together. We learned how to live as people together instead of like. 
individually breaking up and like being like you know selfish stuff we kind of learn like sort of like a commune you know sort of like you said like a hippie commune but it was nothing like a hippie commune but what i'm trying to say is it was more of a harder commune you know we're gonna be doing a lot of stuff for my first album an album called victim in pain this song here is called victim in pain I got into hardcore when I was like 17. Uh, what happened was I was into metal for a long time and I was into ACDC and all that other stuff and I loved it you know, all through high school. And after a while, the lyrics started getting to me. I was starting to get into like the heavier stuff like Slayer. And I really didn't give a shit about Satan. I couldn't care less, it didn't apply to me. Hardcore raises the issues, proposes the solutions, it takes it that step further. And it also has always dealt with things on a much more personal level that we can all do something about. And I, I knew when I started putting on shows, when I did the record label, I was not out to change the world. I knew I wasn't going to change the world. But I could always change, and I think I did change, my part of that world. I, I had to be like 13, 14 years old, and um, was sick of the scene in, in Queens. In Queens. The story of Queens. As if which there was is kids one. with Jim Morrison's uh, likeness painted on the backs of their jackets and Jimi Hendrix, and I just wasn't into all these dead people, you know? <laughs> I wanted to see music, and like, kids were going to concerts, and they were like... It's like, who, and you can't have you can't fun get in a an arena, and you I, know what I'm saying? The thing that made the whole punk rock hardcore thing really special is that you could relate to the people in the band, you know? It, like, I, I, I missed the whole, like, uh, era of big rock arena bands, you know? I started going to gigs, like punk gigs, when I was really young, so... I was always on a level where you, the band and you were like one. It was like you were out there, you were sweating, they were up there going at it, and, 
and the whole you know the whole stage dive and the whole thing you know what I mean it like it was like you were with you were one with the band it wasn't like they were some kind of idols and you were down here like oh well, it only this. happened if the band was killer I think I got attracted to hardcore just because um, just I, I guess as everybody does at a point you just get sick of your parents you get sick of school you don't want to go to work you just want to kind of screw around and hang out and you're pissed off and and then the uh, and then victim in pain comes out and you, and you just you know get rip that open at your friend's house one night and it just kind of you know pushes you over the edge at that point I just like when the band started I had no you know I didn't, wasn't even thinking about singing for a band I just got thrown into it just because I got asked to and I was just like sure why not you know I had nothing else to do Crowd participation. Yeah, you because know, that's how we grew up. Listen to early hardcore it was total crowd participation. You know, pile on, sing along, all that stuff. That's your outlet. I mean, you can't, you can't. It kind of dulls the energy when uh, you have a six-foot barricade from the stage to the audience. All right, there's like four or five different generic types of slam dancing. Now, because I've been around for so long. I remember where those types stemmed from. There was like Jimmy Gestapo used to have a certain style that now is mimicked by thousands of people. Watson. Uh, John Watson used to have a specific style that is now mimicked by thousands of people. I had a style, I mean me and John Bloodcott used to have our own style. Paul Dordal had his own little thing. We each had little characteristics about our style of slam dancing. It was almost funny. It was like you'd look into the crowd and you'd identify everybody you know jumping around doing their little freaky thing. And now you got all these people doing their, I mean, I can sit and go, there's uh, the Jimmy Gestapo, there's the, uh, you know, and he's doing the funky chicken, and uh, he's doing, you know, sure there used to be fights on the dance floor, but that used to happen when people who weren't down with the scene would come out and think that it was about hitting each other. You know, you'd get, you'd get a lot of people who had never been around who thought that they were tough guys and had to be down with the in thing, so they'd get out there and be like, you know, and eventually get the shit beat out of them because they'd hit the wrong person, you know. You let out all your frustrations. If you were fucking happy, you got on a dance floor and you danced like a nut. It was the best. It's the best thing. You go to a Chili Peppers gig now and you see this circular, you know, pit thing. You know, like I, yeah. from what I remember, this guy Watson. You know, everybody would be doing their thing, and it was this one dude Watson who was running around <laughs> around everybody else. And then one day somebody followed him. The next <laughs> day, there was four people following him. And then the next and day, years you know, later, and now the it's the Chili Peppers. You and he don't see. even go to hardcore shows anymore. It is a boys club thing now. It's like these half naked, bald, sweaty guys, which girls I'm sure would love. You girls love to watch half naked, bald, sweaty guys go <laughs> grind on each other. But in the reality, when there was pogoing and the stimulators and skanking. We did it all together. Girls were there. Uh, I love 
you know, I love to dance with girls, you know. I love, <laughs> <laughs> girls are cool and it's a cool thing. Actually, I never did get hurt in hardcore. I mean, believe it or not, never taking pictures. Did, I did, did get hurt once though. <laughs> I was shooting the Cycle Sluts from Hell, not even hardcore band, at the Ritz. And, I mean, I just didn't expect anyone to be dancing around, so I wasn't, you know, had all my eyes open everywhere and I got kicked in the back of the head and I had to get stitches right here. But, I don't know, hardcore is not dangerous <laughs> compared to everything else, so I don't know. <laughs> Crossover was the most important thing that ever happened to hardcore, whether people want to believe it or not. Just when it was starting to get a little bit boring because everybody was playing the same three chords back and forth and every other way, we broke into that, you know. And at the same time, there was people, the metal kids were breaking into hardcore, and I saw them breaking in and liking what we play, so I wanted to try what they're playing, and I got a kind of like a good cross between both of them, and I liked it. I enjoyed watching bands like Carnivore. I enjoyed watching Whiplash and, you know, later on Slayer, Metallica. Metallica yeah. You know, like the real big ones. To There's a riff on the first Metallica album, sounds just like a Bad Rays riff. I remember going, damn, this just sounds like a bunch of long hair dudes trying to play hardcore. It's really <laughs> That's stiff. exactly what I said. It didn't have, the, like I said, you know, like we were like but I really into the groove thing. They the are Metallica. one of my favorite bands yeah, now, though. I now. mean, 
initially I felt like, you know, kind of like, what the fuck, you know, those people got long hair so they get picked up by the industry faster than us or something, because yeah. they're, uh, but that was just, you know, whatever. After a while I did start to groove on, I mean, you know, I, I used to hate Slayer, I like Slayer now. The thing you gotta understand is most of these bands, I mean, some of them might believe in their lyrics and all that, but most of these bands just write that for shock value to go along with the, the power of the music, the brutality of the music, the lyrics are brutal like that, just to, to paint a picture, you know, to give you that full, that full range, that total viciousness. When you think about stuff that was, that's like fantasy, if people are into that vibe, if they're not into it, it's meaningless, whereas if you're singing realistic lyrics, it's an inescapable fact you're singing about and has a lot more impact and makes the whole package of the music and the lyrics more, I don't know, uh, impact-like. Dramatic? Yeah. yeah, it's also a lot more satisfying to do. I mean, I'd, I'd rather be doing what we're doing and sing, you know, writing lyrics and singing about what we do than saying, oh, yes, I am a Viking. I sail the stormy seas. <laughs> yeah, I all that brand nonsense. upside down crosses my forehead. Or Satan. Maybe the, those, like, 5,000 kids who were at a slave show chanting, kill, kill, maybe they need a little kick in the ass and realize that, you know, Singing about raping corpses, you know, nothing taking nothing away from Slayer. They are one brutal band, but uh, singing about raping corpses and all that, yeah. How far is that going to get you in life? You know, I'm not saying that our lyrics are like the most inspiring this and that. It's just what we go through every day. I mean, come to a hardcore show and see some reality for once in your lives. If you fucking let people take over the scene with their stupid mindless violence, you ain't got no more small shows. You got barricades. You got high door prices. And that's what happens if you don't watch out what's going on! rundown of a band it's like the, re the rehearsal studio gets paid the recording studio gets paid the record label gets paid the everyone that the works lawyer around gets paid. the lawyer gets the paid, manager Every, gets pa the, the manager, manager gets the clubs paid. get paid everybody gets paid first and then the band and so a by lot the time of times we get paid we're lucky if we can afford breakfast a lot of times <laughs> the band's so dizzy and confused about everything else that's going on that they don't wind up getting paid. As so that's why you gotta play because you want to and because you, as a person, you have to, to, to like feel whole. I mean, if I stopped playing music, I would like, I'd fizzle away and die somewhere like a bum, you know? Turn into a ball of gel. I'd turn into a pumpkin or something fucked up. Personally, I think it's good that the uh, music industry really doesn't pay attention to hardcore because, like you said, we work in the music industry 
in a mail room and all we see is just it's not even industry it's bought and sold everything is bought and sold everything's paid for charts they're all paid for and uh to get on MTV. And people just kiss ass and it's to me that's why i don't think hardcore should have anything to do with that because it's like such a you know street level honesty or whatever you want to call it i'm glad the music industry doesn't pay attention to hardcore who needs it I mean, when yeah. we pull up to the gas station in our van, they don't say hardcore band with a statement. Here, free gas. You know, when we go to rehearse, <laughs> we don't. We, they don't say rehearse yeah. for free. You Check have something out. to say. You know, we have to pay for all this shit. Yeah. Like I was saying about bands. I mean, it's the same thing with recording. I mean, the studios don't let us record free. We have to pay to record. We have to pay to fix our to rent the van. We have to pay to drive across the country. We have to pay to eat. You know, we have to pay for our T-shirts. We have to pay. We have to lay money out for all the shit. And all, all the times that Murphy's Law had to do this, we had to do this off of jobs that we've we've carried. I'm still, you know, I work two jobs still, and and plus try to go to school and and get my shit together. And it's fucking hard. And it, that's just to travel as across far, the country. And when we that. leave for tour, we all quit our jobs. We all quit our lives, move out of our fucking apartments just to play to you little punk bastards. And that, <laughs> you bastards should appreciate you this shit. Prick. I'm serious, man. You guys should appreciate Yo, what we do. See, I mean, the, and it's the like we don't make money off of this. We, we get play, by. We, if you're a metal band, you get respect. You get bigger guarantees. They, I mean, they just treat you with more respect. Like small, small hardcore bands like us, they don't even care. You know, it's like they'll still charge fifteen dollars each kid at the door. But we'll only get like 500 bucks to play, and the place will be packed. And then some nights when the metal band plays, you know, it'll be 15 bucks to get in. The metal band's getting five thousand dollars, and there'll be 15 kids inside, you know. And they still they always give like the metal bands just because it says metal. They give them more respect. I mean, it's a hard job. I mean, did you ever sit down and have to write an album? Did you ever go on tour? You know, things like that. It's really hard, but it's something we love to do. So at least we have a job that we like to do. Because if I didn't have this, I'd be sitting behind a desk doing some shit job with some stupid fucking suit on, which I would, you know, would hate, you know? This is what I love to do. Well, I'm not going to get into the record company names and stuff, but it is kind of sad that the music starts at ground level, and when it gets up to top level, it seems like everybody is uh, sucking the blood, you know, right out of you. It's like everybody in the industry is like a vampire, and they kind of forget that that it's for the kids, it's by the kids. But you're forgetting that the industry is an industry, and, and yeah. an industry must be industrious, such as, you know, our capitalist government must Exxon. have capital. Yeah. It's all about money. And see, what we're, we're not about the money aspect of it, we're about the music aspect of it. And we like survival to make music. is, you know, survival is necessary. What sucks yeah. is that we like to make music, and now all of a sudden this music is making money. And, and we're not seeing it. And we're we don't, pissed. We don't know anything about business, and we don't know anything about the music industry. We know about making music and making kids happy, and making kids go off and getting that reaction off of them. And getting it's like I know when I walk off a stage, you know, I feel good, man. You know, like I, I feel, you know, it, it feels great. You, you know, when I walk off you stage, can't it's not like it. I feel good. I can't even. I mean, talk you can't describe it. It's like a feeling that you can't really describe. It's like you just put every ounce of energy and everything all your heart everything whether it's anger or positive energy you know joy whatever it's like you have just emotionally and physically drained yourself ready this one's new Not me. 
I was up in Albany, there was not much alternatively going on there, and my friends and I were driving all the hell over the place, up to Syracuse, out to Boston, always coming down to New York City for Seabees matinees, and we were just traveling too much. We weren't getting our schoolwork done because we were too involved with traveling around to see the shows. We decided it was hardcore, we could do it ourselves, we found a hall to rent out, uh, found a sound man willing to work with us, and then got the bands coming through, and it became a pretty big thing for quite a while. Towards the end of my, my college time, it became a, a real regular stop for all the bands that were coming through, that were playing New York City, that were playing Boston, and, and needed somewhere in between. And we did all the black flags, suicidal tendencies, and all that stuff. And the important thing was, there was nobody outside involved. It was by, run by kids, for kids. The bands were playing for the kids. And there wasn't that barrier there that there is everywhere else. And there wasn't some big company taking our money. Jimmy was trying to say something about trying to get paid. Holly was trying to say something about getting paid. And it's really bad. I mean, for the bands, you know, they get screwed over by lawyers and businessmen or whatever. Uh, little labels get the same deal, only worse. You've got to put upfront money, pay cash up front for all the records you put out. Put out a single, you got to pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars to a pressing plant before they even send you the records. Then, when you give them to a distributor, they say, "Okay, we'll pay you in 60 days." Then what happens is they sell out in 30 days, and then they say, "Oh, well, send us more." Well, how the fuck can I get more unless somebody gives me money to press it again? It's like I don't have an endless wealth of cash. You know, the capital's not there for me to do anything with. It was us doing it because we wanted to do it, because we really cared about, and we still do care about, the integrity of the music. And that's when I was, had, had left, finished college, I was in law school, and still wanted to keep a finger in what was happening. And that's when a friend and I started a record label called Combined Effort, and for the same reason. Um, there were a lot of bands that wanted to do stuff that didn't want to be with the bigger record labels and make some more money for someone else like this video is doing. But, uh, you know, and that, that, that's a choice for bands to make, whether they want to. Uh, it, it seems to be very often justified by getting larger exposure, um, getting their message across to more people. It's not upsetting, but when you put your heart and your soul into something and you don't get nothing back, you know, it's depressing and you don't want to do it anymore. So when people say, oh, big business is bad or, or making money is bad, that's bullshit. Because if I didn't have money, if I don't have money to put out records, I also don't have money to eat. If you're really into what you're doing, what you want to do is spread your message and play your music to as many people as, as you can. And do it for as long as you can. Make a job out of it, a life out of it. But it That's I mean, what we're trying to do. Take it as rather, far as we can. Wouldn't you rather put on the radio and listen to Agnostic Front, Sick of It All, Gorilla Biscuits, you know. Wouldn't you rather listen to that than to what you listen to now? So here it goes out to all the pucks and skins and to my own Latin brothers since I am from Cuba. I bear respect to all the lads out here. This is called Crucified.
Like when I first went, I just went as a roadie, and it was like such a change. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. It's so it's so much fun. You have like all you have to do is show up and play. Yeah, it was like going back in time. It was like seeing like CBGBs, and we were going to other states and seeing the way it was. We were seeing it there. All the kids were friendly. You know, they were all into it. There was no backstabbing going on and you know, stuff like that. No, he was complaining that our records were in a shopping mall. You know? Yeah, they kids were, like, were backing us because the record was there. Because if they send away for the record. You know, six months later, they still didn't get it, but now you could go down to the fucking mall and get it. Yeah. And plus, a lot of the other places, there, it's not like everywhere we played was like a bed of roses. There were some places where we had a lot of trouble with people who didn't agree, who had uh, preconceived notions. You, get, you know, you just get to meet a lot of kids who just like really, just, just from your records, they just really get in, you know, just get into what you guys, they think you guys are about. Sometimes they get disappointed, you know, because like, they just read the lyrics and they think, you know, here are these guys and... And they're, you know, they're really righteous and they're all cool and stuff. And we're just, you know, right, you know, you know, we're idiots just like everybody else, you know. So it's like sometimes they just like, you know, these guys are dicks, but it happens. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, make everybody happy. What about Europe? Europe. Fuck. Europe's like gambling kind of. You can play one show and it's like yeah, you're rolling the A couple dice. thousand people and it's cool and everything's, you know, great and you're like <laughs> big and everything. You play another place, there's like 15 people there getting beer bottles thrown at you. Yeah, when I went to Europe, I just like the first day, I was just like. That's it. Get me on a plane home. I just couldn't deal with it. I just got called like a shitty, stupid American like one too many times. You know, like in the first hour, I got like called this, a dirty American like five times. I was just like, shit. What did I do? You but uh, they were just brought a couple strippers on stage. Yeah, well, that that did it too. But people, it's just different. Everybody's really political there, and like they just crack on Americans because you know they're like, ha, you had an actor as a president, <laughs> and then we'll leave it at that. Or they just make fun of you because of Bush and stuff. And just political, and Walter no one, yeah, Walter loves Europe, but politics in general, I think Americans really aren't into it. And in Europe, that's that's their thing. For, to be punk and to be into hardcore, you're into politics. <coughs> and like they were, you know, throwing questions at me, and I was just like, shit, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Never ever thought it would get to Europe. We played Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, and it was intense. The kids were out of their minds because they, they found this new freedom, and it was such, it was such an enlightening thing compared to a lot of kids here that, is, that don't even know how spoiled they really are. I mean, here, here we were playing to places where kids had to pay, uh, like, what would, what would be the equivalent of 30 American dollars for a, a, a Murphy's Law record. And 30 Amer American dollars or 30 dollars there is, is like a month's pay for them. The thing that's great about it is you're always moving around so you could be any kind of person you want in these different places. Yeah. We played one place where... Sammy Pato you know, he was pretending he was a cowboy. And I was stuff. a cowboy. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no, seriously. But for I some, put on like a little fireman's hat We stayed at this one sometimes. kid's house and the kid went out for the day with, uh, with some other members of the band. They went out to like some creek and went swimming. So Priscilla went into his closet and uh, <laughs> put on his boots and his leather jacket and stuff like that and dressed up like all, you know, really punk rock. And we went down to the mall and he walked in the record store and he goes, Where's the Misfits record? Where's the punk section? 
<laughs> Did you do that? That's good. Yeah. You can. Yeah. What a punk rock record. It's kind of fun because you can just lie to everybody on tour yeah, too. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. It's like people just like tell me some New York stories, and you're just like, uh, you don't even want to know. You don't even know. It's a horrible place. I hit this kid with the eight ball in the sock one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, if any band ever helped help my band out, it was the Beastie Boys. They took us on a yeah. United States tour, an arena tour. But in any case, uh, we did we did these arena tours, and we did really good. The kids liked us a lot. We we thought we'd get booed off the stage at every show, and what. What actually was happening was you people liked it because we were live. And but, you're, you're, but it was beyond that because after the show we'd get off stage and go into the crowd and hang out with the kids and the kids bugged on that because they, they couldn't comprehend that here they are in an arena and here's the band sitting next to them hanging out with them and talking with them and we did we did really good on that. I really appreciate that they did that for us. When you go on tour and everything you learn a lot of stuff that you would never have the opportunity to learn. Just in dealing with people, just experiences that make you grow. You know, like you don't think like sleeping in a squat, you know, it will help you out ever. But it makes you, you know, realize that you can get through things and that like you're not, you know, you can survive and you can just have a good time doing anything. You know, I mean I could have fun, you know, doing anything. <laughs>
our music scene is so small, the alternative music scene. I'm not talking just about hardcore, college music also. Every, all, all music that's other than arena rock is, is a minority because there's such a small audience. And if we fight each other, it'll, it'll never get anywhere. Same thing with rap. Kids are shooting each other, the music's getting a bad rap. You talk about freedom of speech and that's the first thing you want to take away. I mean, censorship is really wrong. You should let a band put out what they got, listen to what they got to say, or do it, well, however they got to say, you're taking away their freedom of speech. The only thing they're doing is making kids hungry to, to, to go out and buy records like that. They're only making the kids want it more, so it's only, it's only working in reverse of what they're trying to do. If we stick together, it'll be so much stronger. If youth, if young people stick together, we'll be such a stronger force, stronger voting force. Politicians will listen to us, you know, just speak up and, and people will listen. Now what I'm about to say, I'm not opening the floor to political discussion. I got three friends over in Saudi Arabia. Whether you agree with what's going on or not, it's too late, we're in it. I just hope they come home fast and they come home safe. Yeah! And it goes out to Dave, to John, and to Larry. It's called the Justice System.
as we go, it's more of a, a, a unity thing. You come to the show to have a good time. But that's what we, we want to put out to these kids, that it's, uh, it's about having a good time, not about getting into fights. Unity, man. Well, you know? what, we were, what we were striving for then, and we didn't even know we had it, was unity. We used to preach all the stuff like unity amongst the scene and this and that. We didn't think we had it. When that, actually, we had it more than we, we ever probably will have it because we were so tight. And now it's like we play shows, Murphy's Law plays shows, and, and kids start fighting each other. I mean, on the dance floor. There was floor, a riot they, at their last gig. And it was, at you know, our last gig in, in New Jersey, that these kids just started beating the shit out of each I other. I mean, of course, me or nothing. Jimmy don't, you know, neither me or Jimmy minds a good riot. I mean, the whole, that, the whole but, basis you know, of I mean, hardcore music is, is an outlet of aggression and anxiety for kids that are dealing with things in life. When you get on the dance floor, you go, you go off for this aggressive, loud, you know, hard music, and that's, that's a good thing, because when you leave, you leave refreshed. But the main thing is that you don't fight with each other. You, you just go there and you scream and you yell and you jump around, but you don't point to shit There's so many other That's people in the world that are trying to fight us. If kids would behave themselves and children instead of bringing knives and shit to the things, you wouldn't have to have barricades or bouncers. But this is the way it is now. And these, uh, these people blame us for this, which is ridiculous, because it, it happened years before we, you know, we really? came into the scene. They're blaming us for the, the violence that you know, happens at shows because of our lyrics. I mean, that's just like saying Ozzy Osbourne killed those kids with his lyrics. Well, the fact that there is no matinee is because people themselves have destroyed it, because it's gone to a limit. Like, I was at the last matinee where Killing Time broke up, and, and there was a fight that beat up the bouncer. Yeah, you get these kids coming in like gang style, like and they, they start trouble. It ruins and the whole thing. Well, it used to be the best scene I've ever seen in my life. New York Hardcore was the best. But now with all the violence, I mean, you can't even have small shows. This is the only show that's been in New York in so long. And yet, if you're a small band, you can't play the Ritz. You know, what's, where's the growth going to be now for new bands? Where are they going to play the Ritz every week? You can't. There's no CBGB matinees or anything like that. So it kind of fucks everything up for like, the new kids to keep the scene going. You know, if you have no place to play, then the scene won't grow. I mean, I, I used to work CBGBs. Everything was kept cool. Me, Jimmy Gestapo, and Harley kept everything cool. Anybody went out of control, we make sure, you know, we didn't beat them. We just make sure you know, it was cool. There's also the older people, like he just mentioned. Those people, you know, they, they, their lives move on. I'm not saying that they're not into it anymore, but they go and they do, they do other things, and they can't be there all the time for every show. So what happens is these new kids come in, and there's no one to police it, and they just take over and run rampant, and, you know, things like that get out of hand. A lot of people look into us as a band to like bring back the old hardcore style and which is what we hope to do and I'm telling you right now if we don't if they, we can't bring it back we're gonna get together with some of the older bands and we're gonna take it back basically I hate to say it but stop the violence that's what's going on now. yeah so I hate violence. to say that too but I guess I'll have we to, have uh, to stop yeah. the violence we gotta stop the violence <laughs> Okay, 
Um, Gorilla Biscuit started, uh, I think about what, late, uh, late 85, and we started off just how everybody did. Uh, I hate to be a pain in their behind, but like, could you speak up? Cause oh, I sure. I can't get any levels, I'm sorry. All right. okay. Keep busting All my right. balls. So that's okay. I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As we sit in the farting <laughs> In our posh, uptown apartment. This is just part of our apartment. So he doesn't even have a shit right Where are we supposed to be looking here? Am I supposed to be looking here, you, here, you or there? I'm all over the place. Yeah, like, like, wherever you want to be, it doesn't matter. matter. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's all a bunch day. of bullshit. Everything is bullshit. Everybody's full of shit. Especially everybody who thinks that they're not full of shit. Gotcha, you no, know, I was told him I'd do this with the camera. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Jimmy. Wait, wait, wait. No, it's better. Fucking right. professional. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. It's okay. I think we should kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very much into politics. <laughs> Worst of all, I'm an Islamic, neo-Hindu, Buddhist, <laughs> satanic, Jesus freak. Bands you never heard of. That's old, like, and hardcore. Two. You know my Ligon 2, huh? Old, old like, punk, mental hardcore is. bands. Mental, mental abuse. abuse. <laughs> bands like that. Bands you just have that one. Glory That's those glory. Beats. The Psychos. Psychos. Jesus Christ, the psychos! It's like undeniable glory there, you know? I don't have anything else. Thank you. Because we have so much other shit too, so. I was curious about that.